Good afternoon, Franklin Township, and welcome to the January 12th, 2021 edition of the Franklin Reporter and Advocate News Hour. I am Bill Bowman. And Bill Bowman just cut out, so I will introduce myself. I'm PJ Parker from the Franklin Reporter and Advocate. Welcome, and, and thank you for tuning in. And we have a very uh, interesting program lined up for you this afternoon. We have a fellow who's been on uh, uh, before um, on the news hour, I believe, and also uh, um, during some of our live uh, our live uh, newscasts last summer during uh, one or two of the Black Lives Matter marches that we've had in in Franklin Township. Daryl Lamont Jenkins, is, oh boy, is the founder oh, of. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's our that's our dog. Yeah, um, I, I may have to uh, excuse myself for a minute because one is up there barking and can't get down the stairs. Daryl Dar Lamont Jenkins <laughs> is the founder of the One People's Project in New Brunswick, which is uh, from back in the '90s, I believe, which is a um, a premier um, anti-hate group. Um, these days, it's 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 fashionable to call them anti-fa, anti-fascist. So we're going to be talking with Daryl. Uh, in light of what happened on Wednesday, if, if you remember, we spoke with Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman uh, on Friday prior to her being diagnosed with COVID. And um, she gave us uh, some pretty harrowing details uh, of from her perspective. We're going to talk to, to Daryl about about that and about the um, Cody. No, 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 no. And about the movement in general. So <laughs> without any further ado, and hopefully Cody behaves himself. <laughs> He's got his head in my purse. <laughs> let's bring on Daryl Lamont Jenkins. Daryl, how are you? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Uh, We're doing okay. Daryl, we, we really thank you for being available to do this. There's so many questions. I'm sure. Twirling around everybody's heads right now. That we hope that you can answer a couple of them. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's, what, that's what I am here for. Right. <laughs> that is the entire mission of One People's Project of my organization to answer questions. That's true. So, Daryl, let's, let's go back to let's go back to Wednesday and. The, the 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 mess that went on down in DC, and as you as you know, I'm sure you well obviously you're not aware of this that there are some on the right who are trying to blame Antifa people for for causing the destruction. They're trying to blame Democrats for setting the whole thing up as a as some sort of ploy to cast a bad light on the president and um, and some right wing Republicans. Tell, tell us, you know, from your perspective, I mean, how do you deal with those sorts of, uh, sorts of accusations that Antifa was the ones who were breaking the windows and beating people up? Well, okay, after the Daryl, excuse me, just for a moment. It, before we get to that, maybe it would be helpful for you to explain to those who have no idea what Antifa actually is. And then whatever you do, an explanation after that, we'll, we'll have some perspective. Okay, well, it's, Thank you, you know, it's kind of sort of in the name. I mean, Antifa is short for anti-fascist. Um, you could say that that is a matter of um, perception, whether or not we're um, anti-fascist, but it will be wrong. It is not a matter of perception. We are anti-fascist. And what exactly is fascism? Fascism, as a poster on my wall will point out, is just basically a rigid nationalism, a forced nationalism, if you will. Um, basically, it's a political ideology that tries to tell you who you are going to be um, and if, uh, in regards to, in relation to the country that you are in or the society that you are in. And if you do not measure up, then you are the enemy. Wow. And that is not the way we should be running societies. That's not the way a united people, a diverse people should be running a society. and. We push back on that. Whether or not you take on the um, the Antifa mantle or the name itself, um, that is what you're doing when you push back. I always like to make that point that Martin Luther King was Antifa. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, Ida B. Wells is Antifa, and I bring her up because she basically um, she is the namesake of our website idavox.com, which is our news line that reports on things that people do not want um, to report on otherwise. And that's what Ida B. Wells did back in her day. So in a nutshell, if you are fighting for real justice, if you are fighting uh, for fairness 
in today's society, if you're fighting for a diverse society, you are anti-fascist. Mm -hmm. And so that is primarily where the Antifa group got its genesis in right. fighting back that which is extreme conformity to a certain mm -hmm. ideology that actually is, is counter to American culture. Exactly. I mean, some may some may disagree because there is some aspects of American culture that would um suggest otherwise, and and that has been the case for over two to four hundred years. However, it is set up in our in our constitution and in our um and in our ways of life that we will evolve from what we might have done in the past. That's who, that's the kind of people that we are. We evolve, we grow, we go beyond things that are not compatible with society as it grows and evolves. Mm -hmm. So when we say with um when we say that we um talk about how this is not the country that we are, some respects in some respects you're right. However, there has been problems in the past, problems that we still have not addressed. And that's one of the things that drives people nuts about last week. One of those problems that we have not addressed is the fact that you do have police out there that are engaging in strong law tactics against a certain community, particularly mine. And fighting back against that the way we have over the past generations is now coming to a head. And that we're gonna see a resolution of that. And that's what I mean by evolving and growing. We're doing things that we have not been able to do in the past, and hopefully um, it will take hold this time. How do you think that the Antifa movement has become to be perceived in such negative light right now, given what you've just said? Well, one of the things that we always have to be mindful of is that when we're dealing with a right, a right wing out there that has a habit of controlling the narrative a lot, um, and, and I'm not just talking about in regards to um, anti-fascism and all that. We also were talking about, um, you know, when we were calling it partial birth abortion, when it was actually late term abortion, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they have such a presence in the media and in today's culture um, that it does, it does become a thing where it's debatable whether or not anti-fascism is right or wrong, you know? And we have to fight that. I mean, it's just basically, sometimes it just doesn't get countered. And that's where the problem is. Um, my organization and um, people that we work with, we do our best to make sure that it is countered before it causes too much harm because um, one of the other things I like to tell people is that if you are against fascism, that makes you anti-fascist. And a lot of us are. A lot of us fought it, fought it in World War II. I mean, over the past couple of years, we have heard the right basically try to tell people that you are a criminal if you are anti-fascist and believe that Black Lives Matter. Wow. So when you stop to think about that, you wonder why... Um, indeed, why has it had this negative connotation? Mm -hmm. And I think that's basically the only reason why is because we don't counter it as hard as we should. And that's why I'm here again, um, to more or less counter all the nonsense that they throw at us. And I think, honestly, people do pick up on the fact that they're full of it. <laughs> they're full of it whenever they um, pull these stunts. And we definitely saw how full of it they were when they were trying to charge us with what happened last week. <laughs> I mean, Talk about that. Go to more detail about that. Yes. Well, it, it was com well, I don't even want to say comical. It was damned annoying, I can tell you that. But it shows it was apparent. It was more than obvious that it was a lie. Because as they were charging Antifa, or as they like to say, Antifa, with um, committing all the acts that we have seen last week, the conservatives themselves, those fascists in the streets and in the US Capitol were coming out boasting about being the ones there and they still are. 
we, if they weren't both thinking about it, we were identifying them as folks that were involved in right-wing activism of one form or another. It was apparent to anyone that saw it live. And along comes the scuttlebutt that you see online and on, um, and courtesy of um, the ever so comical Matt Gates going up there and saying, um, and making the charge that Antifa was um, responsible for it. For what happened then and they tried to even attribute it tr attribute their stance to some facial recognition um firm that said yes that's that was an anti-fascist um person that was um a part of that and then that firm had to go to the news outlets and say cease and desist mm -hmm. I, I forgot which news outlet they went to first or or whom they went to i can't recall right now but um, but that firm actually said no, this is not true. It, um, no, it was the Washington Times that they went to. This is oh, not yeah. true. This is false. Decent and desist, or we will sue. And when you're dealing with that, when you are dealing with that, who's the bad guy? Who is the bad guy? Because anti-fascists weren't really weren't involved with anything that happened last week, and yet they wanted to insist that we were. Mm -hmm. Even though the folks that were there were saying, no, this is who we are and we are you. Mm -hmm. And two, the um, the organization or rather the firm that they was relying on for that lie was telling everyone that it was a lie. So right. if you are listening to that garbage, you're listening to the wrong people and you need to reassess what it is you believe. It's that simple. I think the FBI also confirmed that Antifa was not involved. Exactly. I mean, truth is truth, no matter what they want to say. And if we have to deal with a with an ideology that has to lie that much to get ahead, it's time to abandon that ideology. Is that something? Yeah. yeah. Well, the ideology is in the eyes and ears of the ideologist at that <laughs> point. And then what do we do? What do we do after that? Now, now we have now we have seen last week, and even in Charlottesville, or if you want to um, really get jiggy with it, when you talk about the past year where they did absolutely nothing to protect us from this pandemic, now we have seen the damage that they can cause with their lives, and we really have to be forceful against them if they want to force us to live by those lies. It is really important that we um, more or less ratchet up our opposition to that element. Mm -hmm. No matter how many people, I know they like to say that there's 75 million people that voted for Trump. Three times that many is against Trump. Mm -hmm. More than that, over 80 plus voted for Biden. That should send you a message. Well, it, it sure, it, it's not an insignificant number that there were 74 million people who voted no, for and support the ideology of the current president. It's, uh, it's, it's not a difference a, of 10 million no, people, theoretically. Uh, yeah, who, no, no, it's absolutely not insignificant, but neither are our numbers. <laughs> and I think that we need to recognize the strength that we have within ourselves if we want to... Um, stamp this down. Um, the police officer that was killed, the one from South River. Yes. He was a Trump supporter. Wow. He was a Trump supporter and um, and they killed him. So 75 million people need to take a hint. Well, what do you think that hint should be? That you are that this is not compatible with today's society. That's why you're fighting so hard. There are so many people out there that want to do exactly what you said we should be doing. We want to be. We want to contribute. We want the same return for our tax dollars that that you get. We want to be a part of this country. We no. Let me rephrase that. We are a part of this country. So but if you, you say cannot that, deal with that, when I say we, I mean yeah, exactly. everybody from everybody that they, they have pushed back against, whether you're talking about people of color, when you're talking about um, folks of religions that you don't like, whether you're talking about women who are advancing themselves, whether you're talking about um, people from the LGBTQ community, um, 
all the folks that they have been pushing back on for over a hundred years or so, two hundred years, um, and losing in the past fifty or sixty, too. Um, they've been telling you everything that you said we need to do to get ahead. We've been doing, and you're still fighting us. You need to stop. You need to stop this fight, and you need to let us continue on. As your hero Jefferson Davis once said, "All we ask is to be left alone." <laughs> Exactly. What do you make of these folks who, who got busted for, for breaking in and, and stealing stuff, whatever it was they were doing, and then they they start, uh, oh, I didn't mean it. This really isn't me. I just got caught up in the moment. What do you what do you, what do you think about folks like that? I mean, how how strong is is of a commitment to the cause? Do you think that is anyone that is in that um anybody that was in that office has a lot of explaining to do beyond that. It's like the guy with the, they tried to play the game with the guy with the zip ties. They was asking, why did he have the zip ties? And the um, excuse that was given at first was, oh, he found them on the ground and he just picked them up. Can't listen to their excuses. Now they are in trouble. I mean, I was just listening to um, um, the news right now. I was just listening to their um, press conference just right now. The FBI, um, they, they, they're talking sedition. They are talking sedition charges. Wow. I have not, the last time I have heard people being charged with sedition, it was the Aryan Nations crowd back in the 80s. Wow. Wow. That's a charge that, and, and I know they're probably sitting there going, well, why can't Antifa be, called, um, be charged with sedition? We're not committing sedition. That's why we're not. You got to love this whataboutism that comes up. Oh, I love them to death, especially when it comes to, well, why, have, why is the media um so full of praise with the riots of last um of last year and i'm at and my attitude is you really don't want to compare those notes right i mean you said that we were burning down our own neighborhoods and i'm saying you killed your own people yeah <laughs> well, we're probably gonna get a little backlash you know for not having somebody on the right up here with you but um and pj and i have discussed this and you know it's and it's all well and good i mean i would have that conversation but what, what's the point? What will come of it? I mean, you can probably talk to that person at, um, at a later date, but the fact of the matter is, they have to. Sh they've shown themselves who they are. They've had the bully puppet for four years. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And and my my position is that, you know, we we do have an obligation to present the truth. Um, exactly. And but that's what we're doing. And and you can't you can't get on. You can't come on and say. Oh, the, the the election was stolen and won by a landslide because that's just not true, and I'd spend half the time saying no, that's not true, and you know again, Antifa was behind the the destruction that happened at the Capitol. No, that's not the FBI says you're not telling the truth. Excuse and me, gentlemen, I, I have to excuse myself for a moment. Sure, and why do I need to to get into that kind of a discussion with somebody? It's it's pointless, and you know, PJ doesn't agree with me, but. And she can tell how she feels when she comes back. But um, I, I just don't see the point. And, and there comes a time when you can't be neutral. If, if talking about uh, on the media side, there comes a time when you just cannot be neutral anymore. When it comes to somebody threatening our country, somebody, you know, wanting to overthrow our country and install a, a despot as a, as a ruler. And I say ruler as opposed to governor because he doesn't want to govern. He wants to <laughs> People in the media can't stay neutral. It's not. It's not a both sides kind of a thing. It's. It's either right or wrong, and that's just where I am. Um, my dog is making his uh, opinion. <laughs> um, so we're getting. A, oh, PJ, do you want to? Do you want to talk about what you, what, how you you felt about having an op opposing view on? Because I gave my my opinion. Well, I didn't hear your opinions. <laughs> Oh, my opinion was well, just what we talked about earlier. My opinion was um, we have an obligation to present the truth, but that is not the truth. Well, what I, I think my position was that truth is the truth of the the truth holder, uh, and I think um, we have presented ourselves as not aligning ourselves on either side of any of the coins because we want to present. What, what's going on on a factual level as opposed to an opinion level. And the the truth is that if you believe it, 
whatever the it is, that's your truth. Uh, it is our obligation to present varying truths because just because it's not my truth doesn't mean it isn't your truth. And that's um, right now the truth is <laughs> my dog is diving into my handbag to find something. And I had no idea what that might be, but I don't think we've heard the end of it. Well, uh, but I think we do. We have an obligation to present another side from that is, uh, the far right perspective, uh, the far left perspective, perspective, and any perspectives that fall in between, because we need we need to know where we all stand so that we can learn to to be a, hom a, a, a homogenous society. So we can't continue on this path. We, we're it. leading to a civil war at this that's point. There's hatreds that have been kept under wraps for such a long time have found license to expression right now. Uh, and it, it has no good end. It is just going to morph into something disastrous. Uh, as we see from last week, where we, we lost six lives last week. Uh, the, the, oh, so again, were, my perspective is, is we have to tell all sides of whatever the tale is. And uh, Daryl, you're the first in line. <laughs> well, there's been, there's been so much question as to exactly what is Antifa. I wanted you to enlighten people because you are on the inside track of what exactly that is. Yeah, and fair enough. And my feeling is I have those conversations with folks on the other side all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not a problem to have those conversations. Um, I probably would push back a little bit on people having their truths versus me having my truth to what have you, only because, as I said in this documentary, mm -hmm. um, Alt Right Age of Rage, um, no matter if you're on the left or on the right, truth is going to do what truth does. You may be entitled, to, you are entitled to your own opinions, but you are not entitled to your own facts. And when you have to deal with somebody trying to tell you that Antifa started all the nonsense last week, or Antifa set these forest fires, or Antifa tore down these buildings, um, you do have to push back on that. You do have to recognize it as being a lie. And if a person is going to come on a program, come on a program, or or get into a discussion, let's be fair. If a person wants to um, have a discussion that starts off there, it's not going to be much of a discussion. The person is making things up as they're going along. So whatever it is you're saying doesn't matter. They already know what they want to do with their lives, and they don't want you to be a part of that life, or at least of that agenda. Like I said, I did, I talked with the Proud Boys quite a few times, and the one thing that you have to remember when you're dealing with the Proud Boys is Proud Boys lie. <laughs> I mean, it, it just ad nauseum they lie. Henry Tario, Enrique Tario, um, I catch him in so many lies that it's ridiculous. One time he said that um, it told me that um. He earned his fourth degree or something like that. Um, his fourth degree is there's levels of um, of um, proud boy. First degree, second degree, third degree, fourth degree. And he said the way he want, he got his fourth degree was um, doing some community work of some sort. And that's not the fourth degree proud boy. Fourth degree proud boy is uh, someone who has gotten into a physical confrontation with the enemy. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. So when, um, so when you're dealing with those kinds of elements, you still have to recognize it. What I would say, however, is that when you are dealing with that crowd, when you are dealing with somebody who is spouting off a barrage of lies as you're talking to them, remember that you are, remember your audience, remember who's around listening, and it will be for their benefit that you clarify that you um that you take those people on so that they so that the audience knows not only that it is a lie but how it's a lie that's the way that's the way you can handle it and then that's what that's how i handle it when i'm in the street mm -hmm. with these folks well, when it, how it is a lie i think yeah. is more explanatory than just saying oh this is a lie you have to do it like that it has to, to be backed it has to be backed by what the factual situation you, 
Yeah, you have to know what you're talking about because right. they are relying on the possibility that you don't. Right. And if you don't, their their nonsense stands. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this was any one, if this was any other decade, Barack Obama would have been born in Kenya as far as the world was concerned. Mm -hmm. I mean, we lost David Dinkins back in November, and I tweeted out that they did him rotten. He was the reason why crime went down in the um in New York City, but they demonized him so much back then mm -hmm. because he was the first black mayor of New York and right now the only mm -hmm. um, that somebody like um, that they could not um, countenance him being the reason why things were starting to get better. It had to be Rudolph Giuliani. Well, I, I, I'm a native New Yorker. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I did live in New York during both of those uh, 10 years. And uh, I will say Giuliani was very effective at crime. Uh, Giuliani was allowed that, to be. Giuliani well, was allowed to be. Dinkins was not. Dinkins had his hands tied because I think the the black community expected that he was going to cater to the black community. And that was an injustice. Uh, there more was so than I think uh, he was expecting. He there was to be a representative that. of the entirety of the entire community. And I, I do think that there was undue pressure on him there w there was a lot of that but i um i still have the tapes from that era mm -hmm. um still have cassette tapes from talk radio in that area nice. and you can hear how nasty and how much they demonized um demonized um david dinkins and it's ironic too because now um giuliani is seen as the laughing stock and well, when you go Giuliani back to, is not the Giuliani who was the mayor of New York. Oh, yes, he was. Yes, he is. I'm going to tell you, remember, that police riot that happened back in 93 mm -hmm. <laughs> is similar to what he just did just last week. And it, it is just, it, I, I, it kills me the parallel. The black community and a lot of other communities were trying to warn people about Giuliani his entire tenure. He would even meet with black community leaders back then. He was courting the biggest. That was his, that was his audience. It is no it, it is no uh, mistake that him and Trump are tight. It really isn't. And there's actually there's actually a documentary that was put out back in 06 about Giuliani called Giuliani Time that showed that shows oh, everybody yeah. what exactly our problems were with with him and his marriage. Mm -hmm. um, Bloomberg got made things a little bit more easier to deal with. Um, De Blasio made things easier to deal with, but the damage damage was really done. But um, and I, I think if it wasn't for the fact that, and and I don't want to make, I, I don't want to um, put nine eleven in a positive light, for lack of a better term, but. If it wasn't for the events of 9-11, Giuliani would have had to deal with his um, legacy being tarnished by the things like Amadou Diallo or Abner Louima or Patrick Dorsman. That was the kind of guy we was being um, seen as. That's the kind of that's the kind of mayor he was being seen as. This get tough mayor that was getting tough with the wrong people, people that were not committing crimes. Well, that's valid. That's very valid. Okay, so getting getting back to the current day, yeah, um, you see a lot of chatter right now. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of chatter right now that we're hearing about on the right, talking about, uh, I guess, as of the seventeenth, perhaps, storming state capitals, maybe governors' mansions, and and then the big enchilada on the nineteenth. Um, <laughs> what do you what are your thoughts on that? On that, think, is that talk think, is that something that people need to be worried about? You know, um, I don't think we should take anything for granted. I mean, my my instinct will be that they will, um, everybody is just looking for them now, and they will, um, and they probably will calm down. But can't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Do not take it for granted. Be prepared for whatever comes. And uh, and I say that because everybody felt this same way after Charlottesville. We was going to start going after the Nazis and all this. And um, they're not going to come out, but here they are again. All they had to do was calm down for a couple of months, and everything is right back to where it was. And I think it's farther, they, way farther along than it was a couple of months ago. 
that's because they learned how, I mean, when you talk about um, Charlottesville, they were coming out. Donald Trump gave aid and comfort to full on neo-Nazis. But after Charlottesville, they remembered that you can't be full on neo-Nazis in public. So a lot of the groups back then um, started, stopped doing public rallies under those monikers, uh, under those names, I should say, um, rebranded themselves. You don't hear them calling themselves the alt-right as much as they did back then. And um, now, and they try to play the I'm not racist game. One of the most important things to bear in mind is that is no matter how much the Proud Boys um, are seen as white supremacists and such, a lot of them are people of color. That's their dodge. And they, and they don't get a pass, by the way, if, if, nope. um, just because oh, they're people of color. We call them neo fascists for a reason. How is that possible? How is a person of color <laughs> aligning themselves with a group like that, knowing that's at the, at the root of their existence? It's a good question. I mean, I actually wrote an article I'm about sorry. it um, for Political Research Associates uh, with um, a woman named Chloe Cooper um, last year. And basically, my um, take on it is those that are involved in that kind of nonsense, those that are involved in that neo-fascist nonsense, don't necessarily believe that they have um, the same kinds of connections that, say, I would probably have with our community. Mm -hmm. Or they think that the fascism works with our communities. You know, I mean, I do see, um, I, I've had to deal with neo-Nazis who were black that infiltrated this group. And I've spoken with black neo-Nazis. And I do say neo-Nazis, um, not as hyperbole, they call themselves Nazis. And they believe that national socialism can work within our communities. Um, I think that one of the problems that we have had is that we have been too successful in becoming more and more part of the mainstream. Mm. And as you become more and more a part of the mainstream, that means you will have more to protect, or I should say more Defense. to conserve. Yeah. So you're going to have more conservatives of color, which wouldn't be too bad, which really isn't the bad part. The bad part is when you take it to that nth degree, that far degree, and become far right. And then we start having issues. I look at Michelle Malkin from Epsica, New Jersey, and she is a dark-skinned Filipino married to a Jewish man with two biracial children. And she is she is seen more so in white supremacist circles than you will see her in mainstream circles these days. She even appeared on a neo-Nazi podcast, you know, as as a colleague. Or you even look at somebody like I mean, uh, to a lesser extent, you can look at somebody like a Candace Owens. And uh, Candace Owens really isn't that bad, but she is bad because I don't think I have ever heard her say any positive about black people despite being black herself every word about every word that comes from her mouth about black people is of is comes across as loathing us i mean the one time i, I made this point on twitter said so the one time that she decided to um defend someone against racism that she perceived was when it was her that <laughs> So, I'm, so that's the kind of um, that's the kind of world we're living in now. We are living in a world where you do have um, persons of color, uh, people from the LGBTQ community, and um, and women who are just as authoritarian as any straight white Christian male, mm -hmm. and they have to be treated that way. Is that simple? Is it, that's just the way it goes? Yeah. You now, getting back to the the point about um, about them re-emerging several months, you know, re-emerging lately. In reading a lot of what they have to say, um, they really are firmly in, held in the belief that the police and the, and the military are on their side. And, you know, they're just waiting for this, especially the Q people, the QAnon nut jobs. They're just waiting for the signal, um, uh, you know, to that the storm has come and, and off you go to the races, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and I think 
Um, and, and you heard it on some of those videos from Wednesday when they were saying, you know, they were shocked that the cops were actually standing up to them and pushing them back. And they started yelling F the police, F the blue, F the blue. Um, I think they were really surprised. And, and I don't know. Do you think they're going to be surprised this week um, if they try anything more, any more mass mobilizations like this? Yeah, I do. I mean, I honestly do. And that is not to um, credit um, law enforcement or anything like that. And I, I got um, to explain that in a minute. But they have a job to do. They know they have a job to do, and everybody is watching and making sure that they have um, that they do that job. And let's face it, they did. Hit, um, these guys ended up killing one of them, you know. And we was talking. I was talking about this um, before with somebody. Before all of this happened, before we even knew it was going down, it was a um, it was a um, hypothetical about a civil war, and that says. You know what? The problem with that is a lot of guys out there thinking that the police are going to join them when they go storm the castle, so to speak. And I was telling them, no, that's just something that you read in the Turner Diaries, literally. Yeah. That is something that is something that's in the Turner Diaries. And people um, and, and last week, in many respects, proved that wrong because you did have police officers, not just in the crowd storming um, the, the Capitol, but also possibly D.C. Capitol Police mm -hmm. um, that were helping them. You had possibly politicians in that building helping them. So I don't want to um, ignore that part of it. Having said that, we maintain the stability of this country and the society um, because we care about it. And when I say we, I even include those police officers, those military people that they expect to be on their side. They also recognize that they are not the way. This is not the way we are going to um, resolve our issues. And most importantly, when you get to that point where you're dealing with people who are just as quick to kill you as they would any Black Lives Matter activist or Antifa or what have you, then you know that you definitely have a job to do. And you have to stop this crowd before they get worse, mm. before they cause more damage to this society um, than they already have, like, say, last week. It's kind of like what people say about um, Black Lives Matter. Now, this narrative is corny because I really um, think that it's just an excuse um, when they say that, oh, I believe in the goals of Black Lives Matter, but I don't believe in the organization. Well, in this case, they can still believe what um, uh, what Trump is all about, or they can still believe in conservatism, but they also can recognize that this is not the way to go about things, especially if it means that you're putting their families in danger or or their society in general in danger. So they're going to fight you. They're going to fight you. I mean, I told somebody, when you guys go out and have your civil war, who are you going to shoot? You're not fighting Antifa. You're not fighting Black Lives Matter. You're going to kill those soldiers. Mm -hmm. And those soldiers are going to shoot back. And this is one of the greatest militaries that we had across around the world. You think you're going to fight that? You think you're going to beat that? Well, I yeah. think you touched on something that's that's really significant. That uh, people are afraid they're going to lose themselves and their way of life, whatever that way of life is, and the the community, the the white community, largely. Is, is fearful of, of losing whatever it is they're fearful of losing. Uh, I, I'm a white person, uh, but I have I have biracial family, and uh, I see both sides of what's going on here. And um, my heart is breaking on a regular basis because we all fundamentally want the same things. We want peace. We want the ability to be able to earn a living. We we want good lives for our families and our loved ones. We, we all want that. And I'm not quite sure what's at the root of people thinking that because you're different from me, I have to fear you because you're going to take it away from me. Uh, I think if we address those very basic fears, 
we may get someplace. But right now, all those fears have fomented. They've become hatreds. They've right. become I mean, uh, justifications for obliteration and for making uh, my life is better than yours. Therefore, my way of life has to be better than yours. And I'm going to fight you for it. Okay, so I, this, I don't know how it's gotten well, to that, except that it's been encouraged repeatedly that you, whoever the you is, are the enemy. Well, this is where I have to quote Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> when in that Phantom Menace, the Phantom Menace may rub people the wrong way, but he had an excellent line in it where he says that, you know, misunderstanding what we don't understand, we fear what we don't fit, what we fear we get angry mm -hmm. and then anger turns to hate. That's, right. that's, that's how this all works. Mm -hmm. So I guess that the first thing to understand, because I hear people complaining about our Indian community in, in Franklin. Why? What are they doing? Well, they're building up a whole bunch of places that, and so they're contributing to our community. Money coming into our township <laughs> It's coming courtesy of them. What are you complaining about? Well, that that's an, another discussion. Well, well, no, it's the same discussion, but that's that part of that misunderstanding yep. and, and that fear. You don't have to have that fear. They are being they are a part of this society. We are all a part of this society. Yes. But the thing is, you have to get to understanding. You have to get to a realization that you know, there's nothing to be nothing to worry about. I mean, I understand that there were some people wondering how can I be Antifa when I am when I am in a movie about somebody who was redeeming themselves. Exactly, so, that did come up. Yes. Yeah. So the movie is about a person that I helped get out of the white power circles, and the way that he did it was I was there to help him understand. Mm -hmm. Tell us what this movie was before you explain it. Well, the movie is called, as you can see, Skin. And uh, it was um, a uh, movie came out in 2018. You can find it on Amazon Prime. And it was about um, Brian Widener, who was being played here by Jamie Bell. And he was one of the top enforcers of an organization called the Villain the Social Club. And after he had a kid and after he... Um, he started having doubts about the direction that his life was going in, but he didn't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. So um, they, him and his wife contacted me and we got the ball rolling. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and, so this was a true story. This was based, this is based on wow. true story. Mm -hmm. It starred Amy Bell, as I said, is Brian Widener, Vera Farmiga, um, Danielle McDonald and Mike Coulter, who plays Luke Cage, plays me. I know I brought this up a couple of times on your own program. And uh, and it did pretty good. It was on TIFF. I mean, it's, it's certified certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Huh. Um, and, it's, and it's worth a watch. It's and definitely you did, worth you a watch. you did win an Academy Award for this, did you not? Well, here's the thing. Yes, but not for the not for this film skin. There was mm -hmm. another film, a short film called Skin, that me and Brian co-produced. Mm -hmm. Same director, Guy Nativ. And that was the it, it was funny because that was the um the short film was produced in order to raise money for the feature. The short film you can find on um on YouTube, also on Netflix. No, not on Netflix, or on Amazon Prime. And it, it features some of the same um, actors, um, but it's an entirely different story. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a story of redemption, I will tell you that, but I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> okay. I think there's, I think you need to see the film um, to, to um, without knowing what's coming up, to greatly appreciate why it won an Oscar mm -hmm. um, in 2019. Yes. But, I, but I think so that's the, live action short. The the obvious overlying message is that this is a black man and a white family and you mm -hmm. work together to achieve a positive ending. Right. That's exactly it. And, and that's, that's our message, folks. That's that, our message. That is the message. I mean, I always tell people, I always tell people that we are a better people than we give ourselves credit for. Um, 
I think the division is courtesy of those who don't want us to be together. Is that is that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And we have to we have to blow past that because the thing that they're the thing that they are afraid of of us um not of, of us um being divided that's the thing that they want us to be they want us to be divided and they are not getting that mm -hmm. a black man and a jewish man are headed to the senate from georgia i know that's just historic in and of Boy. itself right it's never happened before mm -hmm. and the first time it happens the black man is coming from Martin Luther King's church. Ebenezer, Ebenezer Baptist. Isn't that extraordinary? Yes, indeed. They, now, Georgia is ecstatic, mm -hmm. but that part of Georgia is not. Mm -hmm. And they're angry, but more to the point, they're scared. Mm -hmm. They're scared, like you said before, they're scared of losing everything when they are actually losing nothing. Or gaining. <laughs> Gaining more perspective, gaining more richness, uh, but it, it's hard to assimilate that if you feel like you're losing something in the process. And it's weird too because when, the, when we talk about how the Proud Boys are multicultural, um, and that's only to a degree. I mean, I have to be real. There aren't a lot of Black and Hispanics in the Proud Boys, but there's enough to make you say, "Oh, that's interesting." But the thing is, if you're dealing with a political ideology that never felt the need to to reach across that particular aisle before that is a testament to who we are as people and how much we have evolved where even the hate mongers have to start um bringing in black and hispanic and women um to get ahead mm -hmm. because we have been that's successful. We have shown ourselves that this, that's the kind of society we want. Mm -hmm. Here's a good comment from someone who's watching the show, uh, Michelle Baker, who says, how can anyone not know where this behavior comes from? Entitlement has been taught. The fear is losing it and actually being considered equal. The fears of being held accountable for their behavior. The fear is that equality will cause a loss somehow. Mm. is the loss of being able to treat people as lesser and greater based on their skin color. The fear is that we are a mixed nation and the non-whites are no longer the minority. So, Wow. Well stated, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I know Michelle. We're friends. Mm -hmm. We go back to you. But, um, but, it's right. like, <laughs> but it's like, um, but, but to, her, to her point, she's absolutely right. But I have to give people, uh, as I said before, we're better people than we give ourselves credit for. Mm -hmm. we, may, um, we may have folks out there who have those fears, but by the same token, even the people that have those fears are still reaching out in some fashion. They still listen to hip hop. Hip hop is the most dominant music in the, um, in the music industry right now. Mm -hmm. You know? You're right. So, I mean, with, they, with black audiences and white audiences yeah. and Hispanic audiences. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you still have you still have some a, a lot of conservatives that are in multi uh, that are in um, interracial relationships now. Thirty years mm -hmm. ago, yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, but so it's kind of like um, it's a fear, but you can you could stamp down on those fears. They just have to have, people are trying to understand what's going on. It goes back to what I was saying about the Indian community contributing and people are afraid of that. There's nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, because my attitude, I told somebody um, that even the neighborhood that I grew up in, which was predominantly, um, that's predominantly black, a, a number of Hungarians, we grew up with a number of Hungarians in our um, um, neighborhood that had been there for years. Um, but you're starting to see a few Hispanics coming in. Um, there was a few that were there when I was growing up. I said flat out, you know what? In the next 30 years, this is probably going to be an Indian community. Mm -hmm. And I'm and I'm down with that. I'll be 80 years old if I'm still here. But uh, <laughs> and hopefully I would know what an 80 is. But <laughs> but um, but hey, that's just that's just evolution that's just the way things are going we're not going away we're just going to move on to either we're going to stay there or we're just going to move on to another part of society we're just going to or we're all coming up together 
Well, now that's the that's ideal. That's the most important thing. We are all coming up together. Yeah. <laughs> that's the ideal that that sentiment would actually catch on yeah, in, a, in a greater segment of our population. Yeah. So, Daryl, come as I, I think we, we touched on earlier, um, the, the, I don't want to call them malicious because they're not militia. Militia is, is too honorable a word for what these people are. Militias have a very long and, and, and storied and honorable history in this country. This is, these people are not malicious. These are armed thugs is what they are. Anyway, these people, um, are, are planning something. And, um, you know, the last time I, I saw a lot of notices from people in, in Antifa and, and other groups saying, don't engage them, stay home, let them do their thing and let the police handle it. Are, are, you, are, are you saying that again? Or are you guys going to go out there and? I would never say stay home. Okay. I would never say stay home. Um, ignoring them and they would go away never worked. Um, staying home. If you stay home, We'll be alert. We'll be aware of what's happening, but some of us are going to have to be out there. I mean, the fact of the matter is, if we were out there more so while they were holding um, their rallies in D.C. last month and the month before, they probably wouldn't have pulled the stunts that they pulled last week. Enough of staying home. That capital is your home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's your house. <laughs> And you should be out there to try to protect it in one fashion or another. That does not mean that you have to engage in any physical confrontation. If it comes to that, say la vie. But the thing is, your mission by being out there, your mission um, uh, by coming out and showing yourselves as the community that you are, is part of the de-escalation. If they see the strength that we have as a people, they will see the weakness that they have within themselves. And either they will either they will just go home themselves, and that's really who should be going home. That's really who we should be telling to go home and stay in home. Either they will go home themselves, or they will understand that they have to change their ways, and they will start to, trying to uh, have some sort of real dialogue. Well, I, I didn't see any of that last Wednesday, did you? Unfortunately not. No. It was, it was, it was total chaos, total animalistic, just... It was hate. It was hatred. It was, hate. yeah. it was hatred and dominance and let that be the then let polarity that, that, that I, then let this be the message. Whenever people are talking about staying home, direct that to them. Tell them to stay home. We do not want you in our streets if this is what you're gonna be about. We do not want you promoting this garbage. We do not want you hurting our community. You stay home. Or you're well, going where to does that come, come from if that message was preached very loudly by our own president? Well, well, now they're going to learn the hard way what it means to follow such a fool. Yeah. <laughs> so stay home. To, to quote a phrase, hate has consequences. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like that phrase. I think I'll put it on a bumper sticker. I think you should. Um, <laughs> um, moving on to something totally different. We talked earlier before we went on the air, but you guys are going to do a, fun, a food bank, a food raiser. Yes, yes. Um, One People's Project is um is associated with something that's a national thing that started uh, two years ago called the Anti-Fascist Unity Coalition. And, and basically- One People's what, Project, this is your yeah, own group? One People's Project is my organization. Mm -hmm. And what we are going to do is, uh, what we have been doing, we trying to reach out, uh, trying to do a little bit more outreach out there, holding more events. Unfortunately, COVID kicked us in the teeth. Um, but one of the things that we had noticed over the past year is that a lot of our, um, food banks, our um, mutual aid organizations, our pantries, um, they're depleted. They're, they're suffering right now because they've been trying to help people out during this time. So what we want to do is have a national food drive. Um, we're, we're raising money for the food drive right now, actually, um, for, um, for these um, organizations, I should say. But what we want to do every first Saturday of the month Every first Saturday of this year, um, we want to um, have a food drive in which um, you bring in your donated food and 
we will be um and we will give it to a local organization. In the Brunswick's case, it's going to be um at two Kirkpatrick. Come here with any food that you have on February sixth from twelve to five, and we will um and just bring um bring your donated perishables or anything like that, and it will go straight to um the food bank that is here, the pantry that is here. Mm -hmm. So they can start um they can start replenishing their um their um shelves here. And if you want to be a part of this, if you want to set up a donation um spot for something that you want to um uh, benefit, go to daysofunity.org and learn more and sign up. Um, because we can use you, we can, we need you, and most importantly, they need you. They need your help um, in helping the community the way they should be. That's what we. That's what we're here for. Well, can you repeat the location again? Um, it's at uh, once again two Kirkpatrick Street in New Brunswick, New Jersey. It's right across the street from Family Court. Um, there's a driveway. There's a driveway where we're going to have um, milk crates set up, so it's, so it's going to be um, it's going to be COVID compliant, shall I say? We're going mm -hmm. to have um, milk crates where you just sit your um, donations in them, and we'll come out and and take them, and you and there'll be no contact with anyone. It'll, that that's that's the way to keep everybody safe. We was going to have it on um, we was going to have it on January second to start the year off right. Unfortunately. Um, there was a death in the family, so I, I had to take care of that. But um, but the sixth, which is actually the tenth anniversary of my father's passing, wow. we're gonna. Um, <laughs> hey, my father would have loved us doing this. So hey, yeah, this, he's, this blessing it. he's blessing it for you. Yes, indeedy. So um, mm -hmm. Jan uh, so February sixth. Please help out as much as you can. You're gonna see flyers and um. We're going to be on putting out press releases and stuff like that just to remind everybody that yes we are doing this and then you no know, every first saturday of the month please come out okay all right well daryl lamont jenkins from the one people's project thank you so much for coming on and shedding a little bit of light about antifa and um and uh, the the events that happened on wednesday last wednesday and, and that could happen in the next few days up until the inauguration of joe biden and as you said, you're going to be there. So I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there, and um, hopefully things will be fine. But well, if not, yeah. hey, we have to deal with that too. Um, Maybe we can have some kind of a live feed between us. I will have a live are, stream going. I actually, yeah, um, as things are occurring. I want to thank. By the way, I do want to thank everybody who have been um, donating to um, One People's Project over the past couple of days after they saw the Washington Post article. Um, is is helping us a lot to get things um, situated around here, and we could you and we can still use the help from anybody who um, um who is out there watching this. If you can, just um just go to our website onepeoplesproject.com, um or you can go to idavox.com or go to our Facebook page. We are we're on we're on Facebook, and we really do um we really do appreciate it. And um, it is because of you that we're able to go out and do these things and make sure that things are covered the way they mm -hmm. should be. So thank mm -hmm. you. Well, we, we sure as heck thank you, Daryl, because uh, I think there was some, some question and some initial resistance to our introducing you to and it's the understood. community again. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you're, you're a more than welcome figure to us because we know who you are. But... Uh, it, tension is so high right now about what's going out in the community. I think you explained it really, really well that uh, we are not excluding each other or others that we're, the goal has always been inclusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. that's, that's where in, a, in an ideal world. And we're achieving that goal. We're working towards it. We're yeah, doing good. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Great. All right, so Dal, you know, actually, really, uh, uh, Phyllis Egan Beals uh, wrote a, a question. Have you read, written? Have you read a book called White Fragility? Uh I know the book White Fragility, but I don't. I have not read it. Um, okay. I, cannot, um, I, I see the um, question here. Uh, I don't. I don't recall the book. Um, 
I mean, I do recall the book. I just don't recall what it was about. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, Phyllis. Not a problem. All right. Well, again, Daryl, thank you so much for joining us. And do keep us. Uh, we'll be following your your live stream uh, on the on the inauguration day. We'll be following. I'm sure you're, you're going to be tweeting stuff out. So yeah, we'll, uh, we'll make sure. We'll, I'm, we'll, we'll I'm probably going to gonna live stream at that live. time. I'm probably okay. gonna be live streaming at that time. Okay. All right. All right. Well, good luck. <laughs> All right. All right. Let me All right. <laughs> yeah. Very safe, Daryl. Really. Thank you so right. much. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank Take you. care, y'all. Okay. Take care, everyone. Thank Good you. Luck. Okay. All right. Whew. I am exhausted. Okay, that was. Um, this is a very exhausting, mentally, uh, mentally deflating time we're living in. And That's probably the understatement. Got guys like that who are willing to put themselves at risk, mm -hmm. and you know, meet. It's the enemy. It's what it is. You meet the enemy face to face, and uh, you have a lot of respect for a guy like that who, you know, mm -hmm. for purposes of the melding of who we all are. That sure. doesn't mean we have to be who the other is, but it does mean that if we're going to have any sort of a peaceful, productive society. Open, open our hearts and, and understand the other. And it may not be who you are, but my goodness, what do you lose by understanding a different perspective? How, how does that make you less? Right. That's what, what I have trouble with. Uh, and, and, I, and I've had it. I grew up in New York. I was the only kid in a big circle of friends who was not Jewish. And uh, I paid that price for a few years. Uh, that's a whole different discussion. But I know what it's like to feel like uh, I was included yet excluded all at the same time. I know what that feels like. Yeah. All right, uh, Franklin, um, thanks for joining us again. Um, as usual, if you Want to keep up to date with what's going on in town? We invite you to check out FranklinReporter.com, which is a obviously 24-hour online news site. Uh, we are on Facebook at Franklin Reporter. We're on Instagram, Franklin underscore Reporter underscore and underscore Advocate, which is really clumsy, but there you have it. And also, uh, don't forget to sign up for our Twitter feed. Please sign up for our YouTube channel. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, it's just YouTube uh, slash uh, Franklin Report Advocate. Mm -hmm. um, if you need to get a hold of PJ, you can reach at ads at FranklinReporter.com. If you if you feel like you want to support us through advertising, please and please do so. Um, we need uh, support of advertisers and we need support of subscribers to, to keep on keeping on what we've been doing here. If you have a story tip, if you want to yell about a headline, you can you can uh, reach me at editor at FranklinReporter.com. Uh, one thing uh, before we uh, continue to chat about ourselves, this coming Thursday, January 14th, there is another New York News Hour slated for 7 p.m. with Dr. Alex Karazi from the Interfaith Council uh, and uh, Captain Police Captain Sean Hebben, uh, who will who have headed the Martin Luther King celebration breakfasts that have been tradition in this community for a very very long time. And obviously, due to COVID restrictions, has become now a virtual event. And uh, one of the things that they're going to be discussing is the, the scholarship effort that uh, still needs to go on in, in order to promote worthy, worthy, deserving, let's say, deserving youngsters to uh, go further in their education, which is a lot of what the Martin Luther King organization at breakfast was uh, in endeavoring to make happen. So they will be discussing this and how you can be a part of continuation, the continuation of that scholarship effort through the diversity of our Franklin Township community. So please do tune in this Thursday. We will be putting up uh, the information for it long before Thursday with uh, again, Dr. Alex Parazzi from the Franklin Township Interfaith Council and Captain Sean Hebben from the Franklin Township Police Department both of whom uh, were instrumental and head up the effort for the Martin Luther King uh, celebration 
in years past, as well as right now. There okay. will be a virtual breakfast, I understand, on the 18th. And uh, we'll be giving you, or they'll be giving you more information, so you can participate that in that as well. So uh, please tune in this coming Thursday. It's January 14th at 7 p.m. on the Franklin Reporter Facebook page, and uh, you can hear the rest of the stories. Yes, we, uh, we have another another one scheduled for the following week, but we'll we'll update you on that as soon as we have the rest of that information. And right. our news hour uh, has become something that people are asking us to continue and we would like to invite our community if there's an issue that you would like to explore if there's an issue that you need more understanding about or you just want to have us chat about it and uh, who we can invite to give expert advice or information on please again reach out to either of us that's bill who will be editor at franklinreporter.com or me pj ads at franklinreporter.com or you can always post on the the facebook pages right the franklin reporter facebook page so uh, anyway a little more in the immediate future tomorrow morning at 10 30 if you are um, if you are free we're going to have a really interesting show we're going to have dr perry i'm going to mess up his name perry halkidis dr perry halkidis he's the dean of the rutgers school of public health and he's going to come on and we're going to talk about vaccines the two mm -hmm. vaccines that are that are uh, in use, the Pfizer and the Moderna. Um, I understand there's another vaccine that is that I heard today, and I can't. AstraZeneca. No, I can't remember who was developing it, but it might have been Johnson and Johnson. I don't remember, but they're expecting that might be approved for emergency use by the end of the month. So we're gonna we're gonna look at the vaccines. We're gonna uh, give another deep dive into. And this this fellow is an epidemiologist, so he knows what mm. he's talking about. Um, uh, a deep dive into how they work again. Um, I have some questions about side effects. Now, I, I signed up on that state that state website for vaccine. You know, to to register to get the vaccine, and um, I was told I was put in group one, phase one C, which is all well and good. Um, I want the people who need it to get it before me. But um, uh, I also read that there was some some question about whether or not it caused uh, Bell's palsy. Now, I, back in the 90s, I had Lyme disease. And leading up to my my diagnosis of Lyme disease, because it was misdiagnosed for about three weeks before I finally got the, the right diagnosis, um, I suffered a bout of Bell's palsy one night. I was brushing my teeth, of all things. Um, and I went to the doctor the next day, and I told him what happened. He said, we're going to test you for Lyme, and there you go. I had it. So I've had Bell's palsy. And um, that's sort of weighing, you know, I'm, I'm all for vaccines. I've, I've got all the vaccines I'm supposed to get, but um, that's kind of weighing on my mind a little bit. So I'm anxious to ask Dr. Halkin mm -hmm. uh, about that. So do Is there a, a means by which uh, Franklin Township can ask questions in advance of this that we might ask of this gentleman sure. tomorrow? If you want to, if you have questions you want to ask the doctor, you can e email them to me at editor at franklinreporter.com. As usual, during the course of the show, you can you can um, ask the questions in the in the comments section, and I'm, I monitor the comments section, so we will be happy to have them answered for you. So mm -hmm. anyway, that's what's coming up. We got we got some good um, we got some good programs coming up in the next few weeks. So please stay tuned. You can again you can see them on our Facebook page. You can also tune into our YouTube channel and see them there. Mm -hmm. Did we say Happy New Year? Do, have we been on the air since the New Year? I don't even remember. I don't think it's so. It's been a long time. <laughs> Happy like New Year, Frank. <laughs> Happy New Year, Franklin. You know, my mom used to say, she used to say, I, I, I'll say things can't get worse, but I'm stopping saying that because every time I say things can't get worse, they get worse. So let's just let's just hope that uh, this year is is a. Uh, Turns out to be an overall happy and healthy year for everybody. And uh, we get through these troubling times and um, we come out stronger for it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Franklin, as usual, until we see you again, which is going to be 1030 on the morning of Tomorrow morning. Wow. your team. Stay safe. Okay. BJ, say All that right, thing. Franklin, you say. We, we thank you for tuning in and for your continuing interest and support in us bringing Franklin to you, Franklin. That's that's been our mission from day one. 
So we'll see you tomorrow morning and hopefully Thursday and uh, several more episodes of the news hour coming up. And what I will also say is we'll be back. Bye-bye.